this this trend uh, towards becoming more and more reliant on the uh, data and particularly the training data means that the train systems will have an uh, increasing uh, possibility to adapt to the training data and find good correlations between the input and output of the training data, while then it might not uh, generalize as well to new samples. So the capacity increases, but uh, that also increases the um, issue of uh, overfitting to the training data. So it is necessary to have both training and test data. Uh, typically, one have a set of development data uh, and then one can randomly divide out into subsets, one used for testing and others used for, for uh, training and um, what we call, the, uh, call tuning. Often in the machine learning community, it's called the validation. So uh, uh, determining the hyperparameters of your model. Uh, the test data uh, should ideally be kept in a vault and only brought out at the end of the data analysis. This is from a classical machine learning textbook from Hasty and others. Uh, they continue by writing that, suppose instead that we use the test set, uh, test set repeatedly, choosing the model with the smallest test error. Then the test set error of the final chosen model will underestimate the true test performance, sometimes substantially. So if you keep doing this, uh, evaluating the test set multiple times, you end up with a performance estimate on the test subset that is not accurately reflecting your model's capability of performing the prediction task. The same is written in multiple textbooks in machine learning. For instance, Russell and Norvig writes the same and comments that if you don't like the result you got on the test, you have to obtain and lock away a completely new test set, test set if you want to go back and find a better hypothesis. So if you kind of used it once, you, you basically have to do it and find a new one if you if you are not satisfied. So the question uh, is that um, what does this test set performance represent? It represents an uh, unbiased performance estimation of, of the samples that are in the development data set. But do the de development data set reflect the intended application you have of your system? That could be a, a particular set of uh, population subjects, particularly imaging devices and other stuff that characterize what you expect to use your system for, your deep learning model. And uh, uh, normally when using a test subset, we kind of just assume that the development data set is a set of realizations of independent and identically distributed random variables from kind of this intended application. But is it so? And is then uh, uh, the test subset performance representative of the intended application? So I, I add a couple of examples there. Here it's a, a paper from Wicklers where they applied these dermoscopic images uh, to, to detect the probability of melanoma. And they investigated what if we had the same uh, skin lesion here the same object we want to classify, either as melanoma or not. What if we just did, a, a, did a place some uh, skin markings besides it and then uh, applied our deep learning model with and without the skin markings? And using some simple explainability technique, they then saw that with the skin marking, the, the model reacted to the skin markings and identify that as increasing the probability of melanoma, meaning that with its skin markings, the samples could be classified as melanoma, while without it, it was not melanoma. Obviously, it's not the skin marking that uh, uh, indicates whether or not this is melanoma. It's the melanoma is this uh, skin lesion or it isn't. And in this case, it probably isn't while the skin markings fools the model. So the model was trained in a uh, training data set that uh, 
has this association between skin markings and the presence of melanoma, which is, of course, not the way we intend the system to work. In practice, we want to uh, use the system to uh, get a probability of whether it's a melanoma or not, not whether the doctor has placed some skin markings on it. Another example from uh, radiology, where they applied a deep learning model to detect uh, pneumonia in chest radiographs. Uh, here they applied uh, multiple data sets for the development and they evaluated the uh, uh, test performance in the test subsets. But they saw that uh, since there was a difference in the disease prevalence between the um, uh, data sets they applied, the centers they included in the development data, it was uh, possible to use the, uh, the center as a predictor for disease. And of course, that was not a direct input to the system, but it turned out that uh, in these, radio, uh, um, these chest radiographs included this uh, metal token uh, on the upper right corner here, which the radiology te technicians have placed to indicate the laterality. And the deep learning system learned to associate that with uh, then the, um, the site where the image was taken. And that was again uh, related to disease prevalence. So again, utilizing these spurious features of the images to increase the uh, classification uh, performance. But when applying it more generally, it wouldn't have been the same because this was specific for these centers. So again, uh, just having this test subset is not sufficient to reliably predict the performance in, uh, in new settings at other hospitals, for instance. The, the issue is that the random test subset is more similar to the training data than if you would obtain completely new data. This could cause the performance to be overestimated because there for instance, because there exist data features that correlate with the target outcome only in the development data, as we have seen a couple of examples now. Both of those could have been detected through, through explainability techniques, but in general, that is not the case. So there could be more, more hidden features that correlate with the target outcome that is not easy to uh, detect through explainability techniques. It could also be that, uh, that uh, there is a lack of representability. So for instance, that important predict predictive features are not adequately represented in the development data. So we need uh, data external to the development data uh, to obtain more realistic performance estimates of our model. Uh, so back to this, uh, this sketch, we need to extract a new data set which is not related to the development data set, but is still from the intended clinical, uh, intended application of the system. Uh, so, so it's the same setting in a sense, or same uh, target setting, but, uh, but it's not directly from a subset of the development data set, and it shouldn't be kind of influenced by, by uh, the development. Uh, Ideally, the external data set should be representative of whatever application you plan for your system. And in that case, it would have been an unbiased performance estimation of the entire uh, intended application. In practice, however, just as the, it is difficult to uh, acquire development data that is representative of the intended application, it will also be difficult to, to acquire external data that is representative of this application. So. Uh, but uh, there is some positive side here because, first of all, given that it performs the your model performs bad, uh, good in the external data set, it indicates that at least in this setting, whatever this uh, external data set is representative of, in that setting it performs well. So we have at least good generalizability to one of multiple intended settings. The other thing is that since it was good here we could uh, uh, expect that it will also be good in other uh, intended settings. The rationale there is, of course, that if you take one set that is representative of some setting and you take, uh, take uh, 
and the probability of it performing well there while not in any other setting that you intend is not too large because as long as it was not the selection here was not influenced by the development it is uh, likely that also other settings not necessarily all settings but other settings will work fine for your model so this uh, this kind of um, uh, importance of the external data it's uh, uh, recognized in the medical statistical literature um, here it's uh, a standard called the tripod standard for for um, prediction models it's not a deep learning prediction model it's statistical prediction models where they have divided it and the major separation here is those type three and four studies which apply external data and those one to two which doesn't apply a random subset for instance of the development data so, uh, but how to use these external data sets then? And just as it was for, for the test subset, if, um, if we evaluate the da external data set multiple times, it becomes over optimistic. If we evaluate it multiple times and then select the best uh, performing uh, system. This is the multiple testing again, and it could uh, be even substantially overestimated by selecting a model using the external data set uh, that performs well. So, so uh, the external data set should ideally be used only once at the very end of your analysis and it, uh, then to evaluate how well that system performs. Ideally, it's not only the system that should be pre-specified, ideally it should also be pre-specified how the evaluation should be performed in detail. For instance, wh which subject it is, what kind of data, uh, the particular data that you are planning to use, and even the metric. Because any adjustments that you do after seeing the validation uh, results, the results on the external data set, could, could uh, bias the performance estimation. So post hoc adjustments could bias the performance estimation. We recently uh, published a perspective in uh, Nature Reviews Council where we advocate for such uh, pre-specification of the evaluation of an external data set. So we, we also provide this um, an, uh, non-exhaustive set of items which uh, we propose that uh, one should specify in a protocol uh, before one starts to do the external evaluation. And the idea there is that uh, the team should uh, kind of decide on beforehand what system it, it, uh, the plan is to evaluate and how it's uh, supposed to be evaluated so that one doesn't uh, see a lot of results and then end up selecting the best one. We also looked into recent literature and searched for deep learning studies within cancer diagnostics. It was uh, a lot of uh, studies rapidly increasing, so we had to do some uh, restriction uh, in order to, to be done. Uh, so we selected the presumably most influential um, papers, uh, at least 20 citations per year and an impact factor or an impact factor of 10 or larger. And what we saw here was that the use of this external uh, data set is rapidly increasing in these most influential journals. Uh, and the most influential uh, papers in terms of citation. Um, the, the light gray here is the pr uh, proportion of uh, studies with no external cohort, and you see that it gradually becomes uh, less and less. So uh, it, it, this trend was particularly prominent in those uh, papers study, uh, published in journals with high impact factor, and that's consistent with, uh, with some uh, recommendations and uh, callings in among these editors in these journals for, for uh, publications of, uh, of studies with the external cohorts, and maybe not accepting other studies. What we did also look into was uh, uh, this uh, pre-specification of the primary analysis, and that was not as good. Uh, among the 92 studies we looked into, uh, 50 of them had external cohort evaluation in these uh, influential studies. But all, among those 50, only eight of them had uh, predefined their primary analysis. And this was primarily clinical trials. 
So, so uh, in the majority of the studies, they did evaluate uh, an external court, but they did not say whether they evaluated it multiple times and or whether it has, had had this pre-specified primary analysis. And in some of the studies, it was clear that multiple systems were tested and uh, the focus was, of course, in the presentation on the best uh, model. OK, so uh, we also described some possible steps in the development of, um, of uh, deep learning systems where we propose that uh, kind of one usually starts with an idea, do some initial uh, pilot testing uh, to determine whether or not to go forward with this, to invest uh, resources and time on, on exploring it further. And then it's this in deep in level two studies where where uh, machine learners like us uh, use, uh, use most of our time because here we test all the different modeling options. We uh, try to get as much patience as we can uh, or, or other types of subjects uh, that increase the training data set. And we kind of uh, should um, end up conclude with, with a system that we think is going to work in other settings. But we, at this point, we don't really know yet. Uh, we have some test subset uh, performance maybe, but uh, is that representative? And then it's the level three and four studies with which both evaluate uh, external cohorts. In the, the level three studies, we uh, said that, okay, so if they don't have this pre-specified primary analysis and do this post hoc uh, adjustment, it might be a biased performance estimation even in this cohort. While in the level three study, you both have the external cohort and the pre-specified primary analysis of the external cohort. Uh, which might then suggest that uh, the um, system has uh, utility in practice. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if some of the partners here are, are in the medical field, but at least in the, in the medical field, uh, one then uh, should do a clinic, prospective clinical trials. And uh, I guess most of us has heard of the clinical trials now in the pandemic situations with, uh, with the vaccines coming out. And that's this uh, phase three trials we then rely on. So we argue that um, after successful uh, uh, retrospective analysis, one might possibly go straight into this prospective phase three clinical trials, where the difference between here is primarily that uh, uh, using retrospective data, we try to assess the validity of a model, while in, while in this uh, prospective trials, we take the model and um, uh, use it to change whatever routine we currently have, and then uh, measure the net effect of utilizing the model in practice. Okay, but if we are supposed to be this rigorous and, uh, and uh, only evaluate an external cohort or an external dataset once, we uh, should be quite uh, confident that, uh, that the model we selected in the, at the end of the level three study is actually going to generalize. Because if not, we basically have to find a new data set to do the external validation. So we, we kind of are uh, left here with making the important choice of, of uh, which uh, system to select. And, and then uh, we are at uh, it is necessary to consider what could increase the uh, probability of uh, the system generalizing well to new data set. So in general, generalization might be used both to new data set and also to generalize beyond the training data. So when talking about the, uh, it in the, the machine learning community, one might uh, talk about uh, reducing the number of adjustable parameters, perhaps um, particularly in, in the class, uh, classical uh, machine learning setting, one uh, uh, thought that, okay, if we do not have as much uh, features, for instance, it might be more uh, robust and generalized better. It might not always be that uh, the case, and uh, at least not in the deep learning setting. Well, it could be something to consider as well. It might not uh, be uh, nodes and layers. Uh, it might also be kind of techniques uh, such as uh, depth-wise separable convolution. Uh, 
uh, maybe more um, uh, a more appropriate thing to do for for deep learning systems is to control the capacity of the network. Uh, we have a lot of techniques there. For instance, uh, regularizations, uh, dropout, uh, weight sharing, so on. Um, and also, uh, transfer learning is uh, is of course uh, very natural to consider. Is the network already trained using, for instance, publicly available data on ImageNet? Uh, and uh, is the raw images quite similar? Then, the, then perhaps the weight could be initialized using those weight and then fine-tuned on uh, your own training data. Uh, all these three might certainly increase the generalization, and in particular the generalization to test subsets. But what they do share is that the, the input remains the same. The input data is the same. So if, if the development data set is not sufficiently representative of, of the intended application, one might not get the desired performance gain on external cohorts uh, or external data sets by only doing this. It might also be necessary to normalize the input data, making it more similarly, similar before uh, uh, train, uh, inputting into the network during training and also then before inference at evaluation time. Uh, another technique is uh, data augmentation, where we make the training data more diverse. So we have the originally the same type of, uh, of training data, but we make it artificially more diverse by applying these small transforms on it. Uh, and then uh, the network has to deal with a lot more variation during training. And we could, uh, of course, uh, also uh, try to acquire more training data and particularly more diverse training data, so increasing the natural variation. I will uh, exemplify this by going into my own uh, research. Uh, and um, we are uh, studying this uh, type of images that are called histopathology section images. This is the routine images used by pathologists all over the world. And it should be um, um, created in in uh, different ways uh, from different types of source material, for instance, from a surgically removed cancer. Uh, you slice it up into these uh, tissue blocks, these parts of tissue, and you, extra, uh, and you section out a very thin section of the block, typically around three micrometers. You put it on a glass, you stain it in, uh, using hematoxylin and eosin, which is the standard staining in pathology. And you uh, mount it on a glass slide and you put it into a high resolution scanner to obtain um, your digital images. The pathologists usually don't, usually aren't digital yet, so, so they usually uh, look at this slide under the microscope, but, uh, but this is a similar uh, resolution to what they the pathologists look at. Uh, and you end up with these sort of images. Uh, and it's they're quite big. There are about, uh, about 100,000 pixels in each dimension. So there is some, uh, some issues related to the dimensionality here. Uh, what we uh, looked at in, in a paper we published last year in the, in the Lancet is to apply these images and um, uh, to directly predict how will the, uh, it uh, go with the patient. How will it recur and uh, perhaps die of the cancer, or will it survive uh, for many years? Um, so we try to do to the predictions directly from the, the images you saw on the previous slide. Uh, the pathologist doesn't do this directly, they do a lot of uh, things, uh, diagnosis and, uh, and characterization of the tumor, but they don't do directly prediction of, of outcome. Uh, we, we had this uh, setup here where we applied some training data. We included uh, four uh, data sets for, for training and tuning um, from different places to increase both the number of patients and also the diversity within the development data. 
we had the test uh, data set, which was uh, kind of an, like an intermediate uh, evaluation so that we were should be more uh, confident before proceeding to to the final validation. And here the final validation is is was pre specified in a protocol which we wrote and finalized before we touched this data which was uh, quite exciting to, to be honest, uh, when uh, kind of you had uh, written a document of uh, 40, 50 pages uh, explaining uh, precisely what you're gonna do, and then uh, you don't know if it's gonna work, but uh, uh, fortunately it uh, did work uh, in this case. Uh, the method is uh, uh, first segments out the uh, tumor uh, using a deep lab network um, to to find the uh, region with tumor within the histopathological uh, section image. Then we, uh, since the image is this large, we need to divide it up into uh, image patches. Uh, each of these are 512 by 512 pixels. Uh, uh, and we extract these tiles from the entire tumor area, which lies in green here. Then we trained a deep uh, convolutional neural network, uh, one using the uh, tiles at full resolution and one using uh, those subsampled with, uh, with a factor of four. So this is kind of equivalent to, to the highest resolution on a microscope with, uh, with uh, 40 times lens, and this is then 10x. Uh, resolution for uh, around 100 times magnification. We trained uh, five uh, models for each each uh, resolution, uh, computed an ensemble score as the average and thresholded the score, uh, and then based on whether or not these two uh, uh, categorical markers agree or not, we uh, ended up with uh, three groups here agree that it's going badly with these patients, agree that it's going well with these patients, or disagree. All this was done on the, in the training and tuning data, even the threshold selection here. Uh, in the validation, we uh, then ended up with these three groups, uh, visualized here as a couple of Meyer plot. We have the, um, um, the good prognosis group that uh, patients predicted us uh, going well with, and we see that uh, after five years, uh, five years after the treatment, uh, most of them had survived. Over 90% had survived. So it went uh, went quite well with this group. Uh, while if looking at the, those predicted to go poorly with, we uh, pre uh, we see that uh, after five years here here, 30% uh, so of them had uh, had been. Um, had died of the cancer. So this is a kind of hazard ratio, a sort of a relative risk, which is nearly four times increased in the, in the uh, group we predict to be poor. And we have an intermediate group here with where the two classifiers disagree, but notably this is quite a small group uh, consisting of 10 to 15% of the patients. Uh, importantly in, in this uh, setting is that uh, we need to uh, uh, take into account the other markers available for uh, classifying these patients. And in this setting, it's mainly uh, these um, pathological markers where the pathologist has evaluated whether there is spread to lymph nodes, that is an important prognostic marker, and also local spread uh, around, um, yeah within the column, uh, outside the column locally. Um, and we see that uh, even, even after adjusting for these parameters, the, the uh, prognostic indication of our, our model is quite well, uh, and meaning that it can complement uh, existing markers and improving the prediction of patients uh, with colorectal cancer. Which might be a good, uh, which could be used to to select the treatment these patients will be given after after uh, surgery. Okay, so it uh, worked very well in our case, but why did it do that? Uh, one important thing is that we had a lot of training data. We had nearly 
2,500 patients, and these patients uh, uh, were from four different cohorts, uh, and also scanned at two scanners. So we had a, a high degree of image variation, uh, and these images are, in addition, quite large. They are 100, nearly 100,000 pixels in each dimension, uh, and looking at it on this tile level, we see that the variation is uh, even larger, maybe. So there is obvious variation in color, and there is a variation in structure, in texture, and uh, more. What if we didn't have this much data? What have happened then? In this perspective article, we looked close, more closely at that. So uh, if we uh, have the original result here, with these uh, 2,500 patients, we saw, okay, what if we uh, selected a random set of patients which uh, match the largest cohort we had in training, largest of the five. But this match random subset was selected across the four, around 1,000 patients. How was the performance then going to be on the, on the final uh, external cohort? And we see that the performance drop here is quite substantial and it goes further down, if decreasing the training and tuning data further. So much training and tuning data was important for this good result. But it, would it have to be as bad with uh, fewer patients? We then investigated what if we had these fewer patients, but we artificially increased the variation of the training data through uh, color distortion. Originally, we applied quite mild color distortion, uh, only scaling and shifting it uh, slightly. Uh, well, we could have applied a lot more. And then you see that this top row here is the original images, but uh, and the bottom here is the artificially uh, distorted images uh, th uh, obtained through this, um, this distortion process. So we see that originally it was quite similar to the input, but uh, we could have added a lot more uh, of this artificial variation. And what would have happened then if we trained them on only these thousand patients? And in fact, it, uh, this was the original result with the thousand patients. And we see that increasing the artificial variation uh, to four times the original amount resulted in a uh, uh, performance on the external cohort that was nearly as good as using the initial 2,500 patients. So the, by using artificial um, uh, data distortion, it was possible to mitigate for much of the performance loss caused by having too little training data. We also looked at what would this look like if we only have uh, one data set for training and tuning. So I said we selected a match random subset here from all four training and tuning cohorts, which matched in size to the largest cohort. The largest cohort was this uh, Gloucester cohort. It had about 1,000 patients. And we see that if we use these 1,000 patients to, to train and tune the model and then evaluate it on the external cohort, we get quite poor performance. If we increase the artificial data variation, we get better performance, but still not as good as having more diversity in the more natural diversity in the training data. So this and this result is with the same amount number of patients, but here is from four cohorts and here is from one cohort. So we see that uh, artificial and natural data variation complements each other in order to increase the generalization to uh, external cohorts. Uh, other has recently done similarly as us, uh, for instance, Dake who here published uh, this year a study where they uh, applied uh, two data sets and uh, investigated three methods for increasing the generalization. Uh, uh, they uh, visualize it like this. They have this source domain where the training and tuning is, and they have this target domain where they are evaluating the system. This is the kind of the original uh, color augmentation. The principle is like this. You kind of increase the variation uh, uh, and then you uh, hope that the, um, 
the increased variation will compensate and and um, kind of uh, make the difference between the source and target is so small that the performance will generalize better. In, in normalization, you kind of try to make the images more similar before inputting it into the network at both training and inference time. So we try to align the um, align the the images, but but um, on a image to image basis. While in while in uh, cycle GAN and uh, other domain adaptation methods, you also try to align the domain, uh, domains, but here you try to do it with a set of um, of examples from the target domain. So you are not uh, you're not um, it's not possible to apply to a single sample at the target domain, but you need a, a set of samples at the target domain. They uh, investigated, um, they visualized what uh, what these three uh, approaches would look like with uh, with one of the data sets. Here it's um, applied uh, five different sectors uh, in each row here. The three first one is the, with the same scanner and the two last ones is with different scanners. Uh, the result of da uh, data or color augmentation in this case uh, is shown here. So we see that they applied the very severe uh, color uh, augmentation, making them um, quite different from the original uh, types. The stain normalization makes them all very similar, while the uh, cycle GAN uh, also makes them quite similar, but we see a lot more variation between them than we did with the normalization. The results were uh, uh, quite similar to ours. Uh, they also found that uh, color augmentation increased the generalizability very well. In one of the cohorts, they saw that cycle GAN also did the same, while in the other, cycle GAN was not able to mitigate uh, for the difference. Uh, stain normalization also worked in both cases. And this is quite interesting because um, one in the augmentation in the word augmentation here it suggests that the main benefit of color augmentation is that you cannot increase the amount of training data in a normalization you don't increase the amount of training data you just make it more similar and since the perfor generalized performance is similar in both cases it suggests that uh, it's probably not the increased amount of training data that makes a uh, color augmentation work well, it's probably the increased variability of the input data that is uh, making it generalized better, at least to external data sets. And they also visualized what the, the, the activation of the final layer uh, and then uh, uh, without any technique with color augmentation, with color uh, normalization and with cycle GAN. And an interesting point there is how little color information it is when they did this severe color distortion during training, then the network doesn't react much to the color now. And, but they still have these structures, cellular-like cellular structures here. So, so it's um, interesting to see. There is also others uh, done similarly. Here is uh, one group, tell us which has um, uh, evaluated uh, both the combination of augmentation and normalization on the same images in combination, applied it to four different uh, classification tasks, still hits the pathology section images, uh, and, um, and they get, they get quite, uh, quite the same trends. So the uh, color augmentation is essential, uh, normalization is okay, good. Uh, if you do normalization, it might not be uh, important which augmentation method you use, but you still should use augmentation. So augmentation might be the most important. They found out. Uh, okay, so so um, to facilitate generalization to external cohorts, it is important with varied training data or data normalization. And I would argue that it's particularly important when uh, generalizing to external cohorts. Uh, because these might be much more different than a test subset of the development data. And such uh, ability to generalize to external courts, such robustness, is often critical when the system should be applied in practice. Because 
you're never going to end up with data that is as similar to the development data as a test subset. Uh, I want to point out that the, the amount of data distortion and the, or the particular normalization method should be adapted to the, both the type of input and the, and the prediction task you, you are doing. So, so it's not kind of as easy as uh, uh, always applying the same. You should investigate uh, like for in a tuning set, for instance, or maybe an, a, a, a test, sub, a test set, external test set, if you have uh, that available before validation, to, to investigate how much and what type of method you would use. There is a trade-off here between facilitating uh, for learning relations that generalize well beyond the development data set and not including relevant information, because you do do some either uh, remove some information or or increase the variability so some information would not be as apparent. So you could include relevant information. So there is a trade-off here, uh, which depends on input type and prediction task. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you use a subset of the development uh, data set to do this, um, do these choices, you should be aware that it might not indicate the, uh, that uh, uh, the best choice is is as much uh, uh, ruining the data as it should have been. For instance, in the experiment I showed it, uh, earlier, where four times the color distortion was the best in an external data set, if we looked at a subset of the development data, two times would have been better. And that suggests that kind of in that's again this the sub test subset is more similar to the development data than to to external data. So we should be aware of that when fine tuning uh, these hyperparameters. And then going back to, to the start of this uh, talk, yeah, when, when you're completely done, decided everything, it's first then it's time to validate externally, not, not in doing this uh, evaluation of external court repeatedly. Okay. And so that uh, finally, I want to thank uh, the co-authors of uh, these two papers. Uh, and also, uh, there has been a lot of other involved, in particular lab personnel and, and other colleagues. So a lot of thank you to them.